There can be no shying away from the fact that the environmental impacts of, of aquaculture in our waterways in Tasmania is a highly polarised topic. Everything from views of just they're destroying the whole environment to they're not having any impact at all. And I think it's really important that the people's opinions, whatever they are, are informed by science and, and evidence. There are a lot of monitoring programs that collect a lot of data, but they don't necessarily have the power to detect change. It'd have to be a massive change before the triggers go off. We wanted a system out there that can pick up the early signs of degradation. The seas have fed generations and generations of, of humans for thousands and thousands of years. The thing that's changed in the last, what, 50 to 100 years has been the scale on which we're now doing it. It's not just a few boats going out, it's, it's hundreds of boats and it's not just a few salmon farms, it's, it's quite a few salmon farms and people want to have the knowledge and reassurance that all of those activities are sort of taking place in a way that the ecosystem can sustain and renew. When the industry was a cottage industry just up in the Huon Estuary, what we were really concerned about was the impacts of the particulate. So the waste feed, feces that hit the bottom and create quite a localised footprint. That's why there's compliance points around the outside of the leases. The industry then expanded and so then you've got multiple farms in a big region. So what's that cumulative effect on the environment? That's when we started doing the biogeochemical modelling, they introduced feed caps, and we also introduced environmental monitoring programs. But then we go to somewhere like Macquarie Harbour, and we've learnt that you can't apply all of that knowledge from somewhere else into a new environment. Storm Bay is, as its name indicates, Storm Bay. So it's a high energy environment. There's a huge amount of rock and, and sand and everything else that's being moved around down there. So it's a really dynamic environment. It's a huge body that basically connects the Derwent, Frederick Henry Bay and the Deonta Castre Channel with the ocean. People don't appreciate the diversity of features on the seafloor, the diversity of habitat that we have. And it's a very different system than on land because we can't see it. We understand how continents have moved because we've mapped the seafloor. We've covered, I would say, about 30 to 40 percent of the bay, focusing our attention mostly around the proposed expansions and the existing marine farming zones that we have in the areas where we thought we would be most likely to find new environments. The shape of Storm Bay itself is it's a really gentle slope. Then you have these reefs poking out. One key thing that this project wanted to better understand is the resolution of these deep reefs. So where they were, no one had ever had you know, a good understanding about the shape of the reef, the extent of the reef, their altitude, so how steep they were relative to the surrounding systems. And we've definitely achieved that. So it's understanding where these reefs are that is really a big aspect of the monitoring program and seeing how they could interact with the expansion in Storm Bay when it comes to aquaculture. What we've also uncovered is all of the dynamics of Storm Bay. How can it shape the seafloor? The rest of the bay has these um, very sandy dominated habitats and because of the interactions with tides, with these storms, we have seven to eight meter waves. It can penetrate and create what we call sediment waves and we think that they actually move over time in the same way you would have sand dunes. What my first thought is like, wow, what a dynamic environment. The seafloor is really being shaped by the ocean. Our project, what I really wanted it to achieve is I wanted it to achieve a monitoring program that was robust and it was sensitive so that it could detect any unacceptable changes and provide that early warning system to managers and regulators. Historically, we measure the sediments under the farms and we measure the water quality in the water column. 
We're measuring and monitoring seagrass habitats, inshore rocky reefs, our deep reef habitats. We're also looking at what role satellites can play. We're putting real-time sensors out there. So I guess what I'd say is we're throwing everything at understanding the environment and trying to understand what impact aquaculture has. Because the last thing we want to see is an environment impacted by salmon. A few years back, someone brought me a, a goose barnacle off a boat that had come from South Africa. I'd never seen one before. I'll see if I can work it out. And I'm looking at it under a microscope. You do your drawings and you look up in the scientific papers and some of the papers that I'm looking at, you know, go back to the 1880s or, or earlier. So I'd written it, worked out what it was, and I said, oh, I'll just write the name of the author on this, and I've gone to the front of the paper, oh, Charles Darwin. <laughs> Adam just loves the little critters that live in the, in the sediment. And those invertebrates are so good at telling us about the condition of the environment. We're visiting 23 sites in the bay, cover a range of depths, exposures, distances from current farms and future farms. We've run transex in all different directions from the pens at multiple leases, at multiple times of production, and looked at how the bethos responds. There's well over a thousand grabs we've collected out here and sieved. One survey would probably get about five to seven thousand animals out of the 60 odd grabs. We're well over 400 species that we've found in the mud down here. Right here we've got a pebble crab, we've got a gun screw shell which is actually a threatened species, we've got a small heart urchin, a Chinocardium cordatum. If conditions become bad you can actually see the heart urchins on the surface. It will give each species sort of a, a sensitivity rating to pollution. Then you can make an overall rating for that particular grab and we can see if that changes over time or, or distance. So coming out from a farm, we'd expect it you know, to be dominated by species that are tolerant of pollution. And then as we get more distant, we'll get more species that are sensitive that dislike the organic enrichment or the pollution. So we've got different indicator species that we can use in Storm Bay. And that's really important for ongoing monitoring and management. And they'll tell us a lot about whether that enrichment's getting too great over the boundary. Under the cage, there's still a distinct footprint. And we get these, those capitellid worms that are really important that we rely on to process waste. But what we've seen is that the footprint is actually bigger in that more dynamic environment, but it's less acute. If you look at Storm Bay, in terms of nutrient dynamics, there's, before, we, before we even consider salmon farming, there's two really big influences into Storm Bay. We've got the Southern Ocean, we've got the river influences, we've got some sewage treatment plants, we've got lots of other uses. So we don't just rely on monitoring. One of the key ways that decisions are made about what biomass can be farmed is based on the biogeochemical models. CSRO model the response of that ecosystem to different production scenarios. Again, there's uncertainty in model. And so that works hand in hand with monitoring. So then we go out and we monitor the environment to make sure those predictions are right. I think um, we've really, really got lucky with the weather in Storm Bay today. So we've been out here for a fair while, um, monitoring the reef system out here. And yeah, we're just gonna have a bit of a look see and see how, how healthy the reef is here. So when we talk about rocky reefs, we tend to refer to habitats that are dominated by hard substrate, so rock. Um, and this hard substrate gives sort of a, I guess, a base for a lot of different organisms to attach to that, that can't attach to sand. In the case of Tasmania, we have an amazing diversity of, of macroalgal or, or kelp species, and these kelps grow up and create that three-dimensional structure, which provides the habitat for, for all of the things that sort of follow on from that and also you're involved in things like nutrient cycling and, and energy buffering through wave exposure. We undertake the biodiversity surveys to understand what's there and potentially what sort of environment that we're working in. And then we implement something else on top of that called a rapid visual assessment, where we're looking at directly at that manifestation of nutrient enrichment on the rocky reef environments. 
The first thing to note is that Tasmania's waters are naturally nutrient poor. So a lot of these systems are actually starved for nutrients. So when you put a little bit of nutrient in the environment, it will actually stimulate growth and, and productivity of the ecosystem. Ecosystems tend to respond in a relatively predictable manner. You tend to have you know, an increase in, in productivity, an increase in your opportunistic species. And as you progress further and further along and your nutrient enrichment gets greater and greater, you know, that's when you tend to lose some of your biodiversity. You have a real increase in opportunists. And if these opportunistic species hold out for long enough, eventually they start to smother the canopy forming species. And if you push the system too far, then eventually it collapses. We've got 28 sites across Storm Bay. We've surveyed those 28 sites for three years now. Prior to the Storm Bay project, we had another project running out of North Bruni, which we surveyed for three years. So if you sort of add all of those up, there must be close to 300, 400 dives across Storm Bay now. Given you know, so many people feel a strong sense of custodianship around the coastal waterways and the rocky reef environments, I think, Everyone has a right to be concerned, but it's whether or not you need to be alarmed. And that's why we take our work so seriously, because we've got a huge responsibility to deliver the science on the environmental impacts that's sensitive and can provide the right information at the right time to decision makers. When you look at environments for salmon farming. I think that Storm Bay is actually quite a good environment. It is high energy. Nutrients will be highly dispersed. Impacts are, are likely to be more diffuse than they are in areas where there's not a lot of water movement. But we also haven't ever had salmon farming in a place like Storm Bay before in Tasmania. We don't know how the local environment is going to respond, which is why the monitoring and the science at this point in the expansion is, is really, really important. Mm -hmm.